Hello and welcome to Scott's Odyssey. Today we find ourselves at a frigid 26 degrees Fahrenheit with a 30 mile per hour steady wind at just 2,300 feet above sea level on a mountaintop known as Carnegie State Land. To everyone else who's ever been here, well, they call it a home. Some said an orphanage, others referred to it by the destitute and unclean people who were actually living here. Still, others called it the sand, and yet some called it the asylum. And most recently, it was the big house. To all those people, one word that would have been mutually agreed upon is a prison. For us, well, we'll just call it abandoned and see what, what all this place, what it was all about. I'll see you in a minute. It's cold. Welcome back. If you've watched my videos before, thank you for your patronage. And if you're new to Scott's Odyssey, welcome aboard. This video is sponsored by a small handful of patrons whom I love dearly and me. And that's it. You guys aren't giving me likes. You're not giving me subscribes. None of you are jumping out to Patreon or PayPal. I appreciate anything that you do to help support the Odyssey. A dollar a month is 25 cents per video. Four dollars a month is a dollar per video. Come on, give me a like, give me a subscribe, jump out to Patreon. Other than that, let's get into the video. So recently we had a video where through the process of historical research, logic, and a good amount of sleuth, we came to the determination that a set of caged grave sites were most definitely not to keep the vampires in the ground. The end result of that video was those who were interred in the plots had most likely died to the white plague, or more commonly referred to as consumption, and medically defined as tuberculosis. That brings us here to today's video, the Crescent Sanatorium, one of three state-operated tuberculosis sanatoriums that were located within the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. From the 1840s and through the 1950s, tuberculosis was a very real problem. By the late 1800s, it was such a big problem that millions of Americans were dying from it on a very regular basis. And I say regular and millions because by the time the 1890s had come, one in every four people who contracted tuberculosis would perish to the disease. It wasn't a funny situation. It was bad. Tuberculosis was not just a problem in Pennsylvania or even the United States. It was a full-blown bacterial pandemic that was plaguing the entire world and decimating the population of humanity. And along with this pandemic came all the functional and more so dysfunctional attempts at stemming the spread through people control versus scientifically backed medical control. What do I mean by people control? Well, just like some things that have occurred in our current modern history, it was believed and so pushed on the public that everyone should wear a mask so they would not contract this infection. But science, real science, and history both show that masks were less than 10% effective against the airborne contagion. And more importantly, you normally had the tuberculosis infection for at least two to three months, and for some even years, before you even developed any symptoms. And all that while, all you were was an infection spreader. Regardless of that fact, if you had TB, you only had a one in four chance of survival during the late 1800s. Fortunately, during the early 1900s and before antibiotic therapy, the sanatorium provided the best attentive care for those who showed symptoms of TB. And because of this attentive care, their chances of survival increased to 194 for every 100,000. Ready? That is a 0.2% chance of death due to the illness or 99.8% chance of survival. A similar number that we've become all too familiar with throughout 2020 and 2021. 
by the 1940s, your chance of death dropped to less than one half of one tenth of one percent. That is a 99.96% chance of survivability. And with the advent of antibiotic therapy, just a very short time later, the infection was easily defeated to a point where it became uncommon within the U.S. borders. In our modern times, there are some extremely poor countries that have common onsets of tuberculosis, and they force vaccinate their public with the BCG vaccination, which has a less than 50% efficacy, but is less costly in time, effort, and antibiotic therapy solutions, so it's much more commonly administered for the welfare of the public and, well, the cost effectiveness of their government's economy. In the mid-1800s through the early 1900s, the best way to slow down the spread and treat the sick was believed to be the isolation of the infected at a tuberculosis sanatorium. Using land sold to the state in 1910 by Andrew Carnegie, the Crescent Sanatorium was built in 1913 and opened fully in 1916, specifically as a long-term residential tuberculosis care facility. Crescent Sanatorium was built high up in the middle of a sparsely populated mountain found in the Southern Alleghenies, in an area sometimes referred to as West Central Pennsylvania. It was believed the fresh mountain air and the isolation in the area is what would be best for the recovery of the patients. Crescent Sanatorium was considered the nation's finest sanatorium, and it was commonly referred to as the Crescent San, or more so just the San. The vast majority of the patients at the Crescent San were children under the age of 17. To them, it was a torturous prison. Not because of treatment or the amenities they had in their caregiving, but because these children went in with an expectation of a couple of weeks, but ended up needing to stay for in a best case scenario, seven or eight months, with a much more likely stay of eight to 16 years. When they were dropped off by their parents, they often thought they were just coming to get a medical facility treatment to become better. But from the viewpoint of the parents that were dropping them off, it was more often thoughts that revolved around never seeing their child alive again. During this time, they no longer saw their family and communication was limited to letters that would come in, but nothing would go out without being examined and fully fumigated. Their touch with the world outside of the sanatorium was essentially closed off. As for the amenities, all portions of the sanatorium were kept clinically clean. The patients were extremely well fed with really good food and they were given the finest in medical care and treatment lots of fresh mountain air, and most importantly, rest, so that their bodies could naturally fight off the infection. Now, don't think for a second that this was some half-rate facility or an almshouse. You see, at this time, this area of Pennsylvania was already world-renowned for having non-medical facilities that were similar to the Crescent Sanatorium, but for the purposes of extravagant vacationing. We spoke of one of these sites in the White Lady of Wapsie video where the Wapsinonok Hotel was essentially an all-facets resort in the mountains touting the cleanest air in the state. Likewise, sites such as the Mountain House Resort Hotel at Crescent Springs was competing to be a location of the best of the best rest and relaxation a family could ever attain. And as a matter of fact, I mentioned that the land was sold by Andrew Carnegie. Well. The only reason why he sold it to the State Health Commission was because the land was to be used for an estate he was going to build for his mother in order to give her the most beautiful mountain home any person could ever want or have. Unfortunately, just a few months before the building of that estate began, his mother passed away. So he sold the 500 acres to the state with the stipulation that the land must be used to build a tuberculosis sanatorium. His price for the land was $1. Other amenities that the site had that most of the hotels and resorts did not have was its own post office, a library, a movie theater, a gymnasium, a school, a convenience store, a poultry farm, and even its very own chapel. Aside from the main living quarters, 
there were over 10 very large open air pavilions where the patients could rest comfortably while being out in the open. And they rested in these pavilions all year long, even in the middle of a frigid winter with below freezing temperatures. But not all things at the sanatorium were equivalent to a grand resort getaway. For some families, especially those with young children who didn't have tuberculosis, when one of their parents showed signs of TB, well, there was a need to house these healthy children while their parents received treatment. This was done at a branch of the sanatorium called the Children's Home, which was a preventorium where the children were housed in an official, well, home, where home means an orphanage. And like all orphanages, this home was extremely strict. And many of those who had to wait out their parents' healing tell of horror stories from their experiences at this site. This does not mean that the home was a bad place. It was a small staff doing their best to care for a large number of children who were scared due to the sudden change of their lifestyle and scared for the welfare of their mother and father, while they themselves were stuck someplace strange without the ability to understand why they were there, what was going on around them, and what was going to happen to their parents. Many of the stories revolve around the fact that when the children were not in school, they were put on work at the facility doing chores and cleaning the wards. Corporal punishments such as double duty, kneeling in penance, or the placing of rambunctious children in closets was not uncommon. During the 1940s and into the 1950s, scientists were making new discoveries in drugs and antibiotics at a rate that was curing the world with miraculous medicine. One of those men was Selman Abraham Waxman from Russia. During his studies of soil microbes, he found what became known as streptomycin, which earned him the Nobel Prize in 1952. Streptomycin, when used as an antibiotic, can treat mycobacterium avium complex, brucellosis, which is a well-known infection that can be transferred back and forth between animals and humans, especially through cow's milk, rat bite fever, tularemia, which comes mainly from tick bites, plague, and yes, tuberculosis. This caused the rate of treatment time to drop down from years and months to just a few weeks, where the patients who responded positively to the treatments were able to be let go within a few months after receiving the cure as soon as their bodies healed from the damage that the infection had initially caused. In 1956, with the decline for a need of a sanatorium, this facility changed its purpose and became part of the Lawrence F. Flick State Hospital of the Pennsylvania Department of Public Welfare. In 1964, the tuberculosis sanatorium portion of the facility closed completely and became a state-run asylum for the mentally retarded. In 1982, uh, along with other mental asylums run by the state, uh, the patients were all released onto the streets and the facilities were permanently closed. In 1983, Governor Dick Thornburg pushed through his executive order to transfer all former sanatoriums and state hospitals for the mentally ill into state correctional facilities under the ownership of the Bureau of Corrections. This location operated as a medium security facility for men under the name SEI Crescent until June 30th of 2013. So from a thousand foot view, the sanatorium started its life as well as ended its life as a prison. Since the closing of the facility in 2013, it has remained mostly abandoned. That is until more recently when Big House Produce started using the property for hydroponic farming along with offering self-guided exploration tours of the remaining abandoned property for a price. Now it's important to understand that not everyone made it out of the sanatorium alive. And many of those who passed were never picked up by their family, resorting in a cemetery just a short distance away. It's believed that due to the stigma that was given to tuberculosis of being contracted only by people who were dirty or extramaritally active or financially destitute or just forgotten and unwanted, that over a hundred people are mass buried at the Union Cemetery because they remained unclaimed post-mortal. I hope you enjoyed learning more about who we once were and obviously still are during this visit to the Crescent Sanatorium slash asylum slash 
Correctional Facility. And as always, I thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video.